Um, so uh, as I am not English, uh, I don't know what to say. Good morning or good afternoon or good noon. Do you say good noon or bonjour? Uh, bonjour, everyone. Um, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I will try my best to speak uh, proper English. And uh, I hope you understand myself. And uh, if you're not, you know, raise your hand and I will try again. And But uh, it should be okay. It should be okay. So we're going to take basically an hour um, to go through a kind of uh, difficult subject to see how world will evolve and how we could think agriculture should be organized to respond to this world evolution. So that's uh, the, the very big subject the, the cherries asked me to cover, the, I mean, today with you. And uh, the first things, uh, I think uh, regenerative agriculture um, has a good chance to be uh, on the way because of uh, agronomical, economical, and environmental coherences. And, um, and, and then we have to think soils because we will not do uh, agriculture without soil and we will not do efficient agriculture with well-functioning soil. And when we talk about soil, the most important things is organic matter, carbons, and uh, soil life, which will recycle the fertility and manage the water. Uh, first of all, that's uh, some pictures of the same fields uh, taken in February um, uh, this year. And it's in uh, southern France. There is a little field of prune that was still in the field, but they kicked it out. And you see the wheat is growing better. And when we take the picture of the NDVI, it's growing way better. So this means that we are not at the maximum of yield, even in the good area, growing area. There is some yield potential to grab. Um, second thing, if you look at the economy, well, in the old time, we had a kind of flat rate to sell our crops. Uh, remember in France, every month we were getting a franc more per 100 kilograms, and so you knew basically how much you will sell your crop. And in 2007, everything changed, and uh, the price went up, and has the price of fuel, has the price of fertilizer. The red is the price of fertilizer. And at that time, we tried to figure out what will be the future. Well, the future... I mean, it's very uneven things, unpredictable things. I mean, because of the price of the commodities we are producing, I mean, we've seen that recently last year, um, because of the price of fertilizer, because of the price of fuel, also because of the climate as well, as you are experiencing, and we are experiencing a very strange spring this year, okay? So this will mean that uh, we will be facing a lot of up and downs. And in, in an up and down strategy like that, we have to reduce our cost of production to the lowest as possible per ton, which means uh, that's uh, uh, not the red line, the black line, which means if your cost of production is very low per ton, this means a very good year, you will have a nice margin, and a bad year, well, you may lose a little bit, but you may not lose the income of the year before or the future year. If you are running towards the red one, well, this means that the year you will make some money, but the next year you can lose out all the money you made the year before. So it, it is very strategic to think about net cost of production per ton uh, or per kilo uh, meat or per egg. Uh, I like uh, some Australian friends figured out also uh, how much grain you should sell to buy an Ilux. Okay, well, uh, you could do the same thing for the Land Rover here. And, uh, well, when you look at the trend, I don't think it's going down. This means the same for fuel, this is the same for machinery. I mean, things will cost more and more per grain we are producing. Um, one other thing, uh, it's coming from the United States. It's uh, research uh, uh, across 40 uh, farmers growing corn. And uh, I'm sorry, I'm talking sometimes a bit American, growing mice. Uh, and uh, they, they showed the net profit according, when you look at the red curve, according to the soil density. So if you reduce the soil density, which means you increase the porosity of the soil, your net profit income. 
increase. And the second one, the blue line, uh, it's what we call a particular organic matter percentage in the s total soil organic matter, which means when you change of practices, you had more cover crop and uh, more soil life and put leaving the organic matter on the top of the soil, that's a portion of the organic matter you increase. And if you increase the type of organic matter in your system, your profit per hectare is increasing. So we have to aim for better soil, and the American show, uh, I mean, North American show that is linking to profit. When we look at uh, this graph coming from the same experience, you can see the top, uh, the regenerative farmers are uh, having a little bit more better yield, but they're spending less. So the margin per ton is better. And uh, the first on the top is cover crop seed. So they're spending on cover crop seed, but if you look at the fertilizer, okay, they're spending a lot less fertilizer. Okay, so if you had cover crop and fertilizer, it's a lot less spanning. If you look, another thing quite interesting, irrigation. Okay, so because it's a better water management, they use less water when you do irrigation. Um, another thing, uh, it is the uh, second uh, box, it's uh, herbicide. There is no big change in herbicide. I mean, when you're growing crops, I mean, you still have to have clear field and clean fields. And uh, whether no-till or uh, conventional, we still use a bit of herbicide. Uh, other things, you look at crop insurance, less crop insurance for the regenerative farmers because you're more secure in your system, so you need less insurance. And then if you look at corn seed, Okay, the conventional use more corn seed in terms of dollars than the uh, uh, regenerative one. It is because they use a lot of GMO traits, and each time you pile up one GMO traits on the corn seed, you add fifty dollars per hectare each time. So it's an extra spanning. So this, at the end of the day or the end of the year, make a quite a difference, in, and it's how I foresee agriculture. Then. The price and the availability of energy will probably impose the way we farm tomorrow. It's really already shaped the way we farm today. Um, because if you look uh, at the energy we put in, a, in a tractors and the energy to build the tractors, well, it's uh, mechanization. And then if you look irrigation, but there is not much irrigation here, but the country where I come from, we do quite a lot of irrigation. The agrochemicals are very good in terms of energy balance. And then you get to end fertilizer. End fertilizer, well, is the big deal of energy. And we understood that straight away in uh, 2002 when we saw the rise of price of energy or gas. And then when you start asking the price of urea and say well, it's going to be a rip off, you know. And, and, and then if you look at what happened in terms of energy, that's the French agriculture. Um, from uh, 1882 to 2013. I'm pretty much sure it happened the same way in England. Uh, when you look on, on, on the old side, I mean, there is a lot of energy spent for farmers. I mean, feeding the farmers. Most of the population were farmers. Draft animals in traction and also draft animals in maintenance. Well, a uh, horse is not like a tractor. When you turn off the key of your tractor, it's not using energy no more. But when you put the horse in the stable, you still have a lot of work and to feed him every day that he's sure he can come back and work when you need it. And you see, when we arrived uh, around the war and after the war, we got, got rid of many farmers, got rid of all the horses, and uh, we replaced that by tractors. And the second thing that came in our agriculture is nitrogen fertilizer. And you see the big part of fertilizer in terms of energy is very big. And then you got for all agriculture in France, the greenhouses, the facilities, and you got what in houses, they put the irrigation, agrochemicals, and other fertilizers, all those little things. It's the all the agriculture in France that includes cereal, beef, dairy, glass house, and uh, horses and everything, wineries, I forgot about the wineries. And um, so this is quite interesting that we are not using more energy than we are using 150 years ago, basically, but it's a different sort of energy. At that time, it was 100% renewable. Now it's 100% fossil energy. That's a big change. 
And if you look at the chart on other side, energy invested, it's in joule, in petajoule, 10, 15. And uh, energy produced is in June also, and it's, f it's uh, from 0 to 1,400, and the other one is 0 to uh, 1,000, uh, to only 400. And if you look at better way, the net production of energy, the uh, red curve, it should be like that. So today, by putting uh, one energy unit into the system, we almost got four energy units out of the agriculture. In the old time, by putting one energy unit, a joule or whatsoever, you're getting 1.8. So our agriculture, even if it's using fossil energy, has improved the energy balance, and we're talking of all energy. If we, if we go back to comparing that to other renewable energy, we're well placed. We are well placed. And if you look at the energy produced by different crops uh, in terms of equivalent of fuel per hectare and per year, I mean, uh, when you talk looking at cereals, you can grow a lot of energy if you look at it as energy. A sugar beet, for example, when you look at the level of ethanol potential, is almost a liter of ethanol per square meter. So who could do better than that? A liter, 10,000 liters of ethanol per hectare. Okay, so it will n maybe not be enough to run all the cars of the countries, but it is already quite a lot of energy to make agriculture self-sufficient of energy. We also have a lot of biomass that can produce gas as well, and, uh, and that could be very interesting. And we have also new project coming in France to grow second crop, Camelina, in order to grow biofuel as a second crop instead of a cover crop after barley. So uh, it's not uh, really uh, working well, but uh, we have trials in fields, and there is probably a good future in that. We have also to thank, because we will have longer season, we have seen that last year, that probably uh, second harvest, it what happened already in our country, that is second corn after barley. I mean, people in France have harvested barley already a week or two weeks ago, almost, in some areas. So this corn is, was taken the 15th of July, a few years ago. And, uh, and second crop, it's a guy in south of France with irrigation. He managed uh, in, uh, to grow in uh, 2019 um, 9.7 uh, ton in winter barley with a bit of irrigation, and then 11.4 ton of corn. So he harvests 21 ton in only one year. And he came to me and said, sorry, Fred, I didn't have to grow cover crop. But he had always something growing. And uh, in the market today, when you got 20 ton to sell, that's not that bad. There is a bit of irrigation, but it's not that bad. Um, this extension of a season uh, may organize more towards relay cropping and uh, growing big cover crop, simple or relay. And some farmers are showing that they can uh, enter a quarter of nitrogen into the cover crop. I um, mean, basically to enter 50 to 80 kilos of nitrogen with a cover crop and recycle 50 to 80 kilos gram of nitrogen is quite easy to do. Uh, but if you push a little bit further, you can do better than that. And we can really capitalize N and really reduce the use of nitrogen. This doesn't mean that we don't need nitrogen to grow crop. We need nitrogen but reduce the n synthetic nitrogen that we bring. And I took the um, example of my friend Steve Grof in Pennsylvania that was able to grow corn a couple of years ago uh, without any nitrogen fertilizer. I mean, whatever he put nitrogen or not, he had the same yield of corn, basically. But we need to localize sometime fertilizer most of the time in order to succeed. Because uh, if you want to push the cover crop, you need to bring fertility early in the, in the beginning of the crop. It reduce also the water evaporation. And that is uh, a big deal, especially in dry country. Uh, well, it's hard to say that in England with the weather you're experiencing at the moment. But, uh, well, it looks like you're becoming a dry country. Sorry about that. But uh, uh, with a good cover like that, I mean, you save a lot of moisture. And uh, this is something we have to think about it. And it might can make a big, big change. Then we have to bear in mind 
uh, most of our farming is capturing carbon. Most of the constituent of uh, any plant, whether which is wheat, which is grass, which is wood, is carbon for 40-45% okay, uh, of the dry matter. The second is oxygen, the third is hydrogen, and, and nitrogen is just a little pad. So uh, we have to be geared towards carbon. And carbon start to be a big deal today. And we're starting having ca carbon contract because uh, uh, everybody wants to be carbon neutral, but uh, who can neutralize the carbon except the one that managing photosynthesis? And we are the one managing photosynthesis. So I got granted uh, for uh, 1.7 ton of equivalent CO2 on the farm. That's all the results. And we got some money for the year 22 about that. So I look at this money as a bonus because it's an incentive to do better. Uh, a subsidy, it's uh, some money to help you to do something you don't like to do. Okay, And so it's a big difference. And uh, uh, I drive a Volkswagen T1. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I, sh I have a little problems d coming here because the steering wheel is on the wrong side. But uh, I manage the Tiguans can go around England all right. And uh, with all I do on my farm, uh, sequestrating CO2, and if you divide by the emission of my Tiguan per kilometers, uh, I can probably do one million miles per year. 40 times around the world. So I can come twice in England, that's what I've done in, in this year, and drive a little bit. So I'm fine with that, I'm fine. I will come back. Uh, Sometimes take the plane just to give you an idea how strong is agriculture. And I go in Minnesota because I like black dirt. And uh, one way is 600 kilos something. So two ways is 1.3 tons of carbon emitted if you go uh, with the airplane. So I would be able to go to the United States uh, 177 times. Amazing, just with my farm. Uh, if we compare, and I, I compare to planting trees with eco tree, and uh, if I take all the figures, okay, uh, a tree just start uh, taking uh, carbon out of the atmosphere a uh, few years after you planted it. It's not straight away, and so I would have to plant 50 hectares of forest on my farm in order to be the same way. So and straight away, you imagine what you can do with soil farming. That brings me to what I call carbon story. If you look at what happened, okay, the CO2 increasing in the air. So, I mean, the media is repeating that all the time. But if you go in uh, Hawaii, Mauna Loa, um, which is the a kind of neutral area around the world, and uh, you can see it's going up and down during the year. And see if this works. This is a video from NASA. And uh, you see it was a video from 2006, and we are the 15th, 14th of January. And you will see, you're saying that uh, the CO2 is emitted by three main blocks of countries. One is China, the second one is Europe, and the third one is United States, or whatsoever. Uh, and the red, the very red, you know, it's the emission of uh, CO2. And, and this means that during our winter, we are emitting a lot of CO2, and this is measurable. But you will see, as we're getting to our, uh, our uh, summer, I mean, not uh, spring and summer, and soon, I mean, the video is not running fast enough, but it will come, uh, the photosynthesis start, okay? And the f when the photosynthesis start, the amount of CO2 is really reducing a lot. We say when we get to the end of April, well, then we, we send a lot of CO2 into this air, this atmosphere. But then you see we are in May, starting to clear off. So it's mainly forest, but it's also agriculture. And this gives you the power of photosynthesis. This means that we are smart enough, we can decrease the amount that we are releasing into the atmosphere. And if you do a most productive agriculture intensive photosynthesis, we can enter I mean carbon more into the system. So you see how it's clearing off in June and in July it will be almost disappeared, the power of photosynthesis. All right, and also cool the soil. It's a picture taken from a drone in south of France and the red part is 47 degrees, the outside temperature is 31, it's in September. 
And where the cover crop is, is only 29, 20 degrees difference basically, by just playing with cover. So we have to cover and green, I mean, all the environment in order to get away from hot spot. I mean, there is a lot of big hot spots, which are cities, okay? So they got to green themselves as well. And some uh, people in Northern America have changed already things. And uh, well, uh, I start working in, in, in the corner of that in Minnesota uh, in 82. And so I'm not responsible for what happened. I'm just uh, watch what happened. And uh, over the years, well they change the way they farm. And instead of being dry farming and cultivating the soil every other year, they go cover crop and corn and soya bean and wheat every year now. And so they completely change the rotation. It's what happened in Saskatchewan and between uh, 1991 and you look in 2001, the fallow system is, is finished. Okay, and the final system was increasing the desertification of those areas and the erosion. By the time they got more green into the prairie, uh, they almost cool the prairie weather, and it's uh, raining more and it's raining more often with li more little rain. So uh, it's uh, I mean some some people have changed the cli climate positively s by changing agriculture. All right, all right. Uh, if you put a map of England and a map of France in this area. It's not because you're changing what you do in your field that you're changing the climate. You, you need a way bigger area. And the world where everyone wants to be carbon neutral, we're going to soon wake up where we get carbon neutrality. Because there is no industry that is able to neutralize itself. By the time you start moving something, you're using steel, you're using energy. So you're emitting carbon. So the only one is the one doing photosynthesis. Who is doing photosynthesis? I think that's uh, so. Sooner or later, I mean, I don't know how it is in England, but I guess it is the same in France. Each time you open the TV, I mean, or listen to radio, or open the paper, agriculture is pictured by the worst things for the planet. We got to stop farming and we have to kill all the cows and everything. I will come back on that. Now, uh, we can change a lot of things, and it is very evident. So we have to farm the sun and uh, to harvest the rain and, uh, and even much more. And this will help us to keep farming and to keep to be producing in a very changing weather. And uh, this, and there is some doc interesting uh, documenting about that. If the area is large enough, it also bring more rain. Amazing. Because if you want to more rain, you have to have more transpiration. If you reduce the transpiration, you have less rain. So there is a lot of people, I think you got the same here in England, they say with the warming of the climate, we will have to plant cactus. Well, if we plant cactus, well, we will, uh, we will uh, bring desert faster here, faster in France. No, we have to bring plant that green, that use a lot of water, that transpirate the water and bring more rain. It's the contrary we have to do. And we already got companies like this one doing popcorn, uh, f I mean, monitoring the carbon and the cover crop. It's our drilling of popcorn and, uh, and doing that with the uh, 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 satellite and showing uh, good results, how much carbon you get in it. Because the carbon will bring us to true stories because we can measure things. It's not, uh, it's we will get to results. And you see how much carbon we can store every day. And more you grow your cover crop, more you bring carbon in, and more you grow corn, more carbon you get in. So it is a very good news. And you see, it in terms of CO2, it's 9.15 tons of CO2 per year get into the system. Okay? And, uh, and then we have once more to reduce nitrogen need. So we need more crop association. I mean, uh, and because most of the people think that by putting wheat and pea together, the pea give nitrogen to the wheat, which is not true. Uh, there I it's just not competing for nitrogen. So he leave the nitrogen for the wheat and the pea can get his own nitro nitrogen. So you get a better yield by using more better the moisture, better, uh, I mean, the sunlight and everything. But it's not a question of sharing nitrogen, but you can increase the yield. Um, those associations are quite difficult. They are inorganic, but why not a smaller association? 
mustard pea. This picture comes from Canada. And or it could be uh, a spring, oyster grape, and pea. And this could be interesting for you to break up the rotation and also to grow nice cover crop to enter more diversity and bring more nitrogen to the system. And you can still use uh, grass herbicide to do to to clean uh, the black grass or the, or the rye grass into the system there is just a little sorting out afterwards so i'm here in canada three ways or four ways mixed uh, flax and 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 lean together or triple crop red anti pea yellow mustard i mean those guys are doing that on on uh, hundreds of hectares and uh, it's just a little bit of sorting out if you look at the red land tile we're getting in our uh, supermarket, most of them come from Canada. Well, they managed to grow that, but they sort, they sort that out. One success we had in France is uh, OSR with companion plants. I mean, at the beginning, we thought it was impossible. But now, with more than 15 years of experience, we know that we, when we increase the biomass, when we increase the biomass of the companion crops in the OSR, that means that we have more competition, we increase the yield of the oyster grape. Amazing. We, we at the beginning, we were a bit uh, shy. Is you put few plants, few flowers, it's enough. Now we're getting uh, way further. When you look at this uh, recent uh, uh, trial, we are at 4.5 tons of uh, yield with our companion crop. With uh, a small uh, bean, which is Fevrol, we gain 3.3 th uh, tons. And when you change the, b the b variety of beans, which is a bigger bean, you got almost 4.5 ton extra. So you get to 5 ton oilseed rape just by putting a bean with the oilseed rape. It's not a big deal, just few seed. And if you look at this recent uh, research, uh, around the circle, you got the yield with zero nitrogen and uh, 2.5 ton is without um, the beans and the 3.3 tons is with the beans. And the pictures on the bottom uh, showing you with beans, without beans. Just by putting beans with the oil seed rape, you can get almost 8 tons of, uh, 0.8 tons of oil seed rape. Amazing. And then when you go to dose X, X which is in the normal application of nitrogen, you still have an increase of yield. So as a farmer, you can make your choice whether I, uh, I reduce my nitrogen application, whether I keep the same nitrogen application and I aim for better yield. But there is always good option. And that's uh, from last year, the same trial. Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain, but by the time we put, if you look at the first line and the second line, the green is the way, the green line is the way or uh, the weight of uh, oilseed rape. And by putting a cover crop, we even increase the dry weight of the dry matter of the oilseed rape, plus the cover crop. And if you look at the last line, uh, it's témoin sans couvert. It's the weight of the oilseed rape without any cover crop. So by putting a cover crop with the oilseed rape, we doesn't harm the weight of the oil seed rape. And that was the last try last year. You see how big is a cover crop on oil seed rape? You think we must be crazy. So we had to, to chop it. We'll see the yield this year, what come up this year, but uh, it's amazing what we've done. And, and still with oil seed rape, when you look at that, I mean, chopping a big cover crop on it. With oil seed rape, maybe getting further, keeping the beans inside, and uh, the brassicas and the legume, the two brands of plant which love each other. And we put winter peas on oilseed rape, and we forgot about them, but after flowering of the oilseed rape, we got the winter peas getting off. It's, you know, and, and then we harvest everything together. And well, there is a little bit of uh, sorting out at the end, but uh, it's extra production. And then we're starting to study flea beetle management by grazing the the companion with the sheep. I mean, it's amazing. But uh, the oil seed rape companies in France are already issuing uh, some interesting results because, uh, you know, they, 
the, those flea beetles stay in, in, in the canopy of the oilseed rape. And when the sheep, uh, you know, graze them, it's probably extra good protein for them, but they reduce. Uh, you are a little bit late at flowering in spring, but uh, it changed. And today we got also a trial of a push and pull system that we grow radish on the side of oilseed rape young fields in order to get the flea beetles getting on the radish cover crop and not getting in the oilseed rape field. Now we got uh, interesting trials on the way that way. Oilseed rape also help us to introduce legume in a rotation and uh, perennial legume. And uh, getting to this uh, to the end with uh, uh, still nitrogen uh, production. And that's the level of nitrogen you can produce with the two years of alpha alpha, two years of lucerne. And uh, a scientist in Iran, France, figured out that two years of lucerne, he studied that, you see, for 30 years. In a forage, you can have 600 to 700 kilograms of nitrogen. 600 to 700 kilograms of nitrogen in a forage of lucerne during two years. Did I make myself understood? And if you put after what he called the N, uh, uh, after the alfalfa, he put four crops, and he put first uh, the first year wheat, corn, wheat, and barley, and he measured the nitrogen, the roots left in the soil for the four crops following, and came back to alfalfa and went five times like that. And he figured out the first year was 80 kilogram, the third year, second year was 47, the third year was 48. And the last year, fourth year, was 25th. So in total, 200 kilogram extra. So this means that two years of alfalfa, of lucerne, on a farm of perennial could bring between eight or 900 kilograms of nitrogen. Amazing. So at that time, I figured out with different results, and I found almo almost the same result with the information we got today. And this chart comes from his presentation that he's done 25 years ago. Okay, so it is all farming, and so if you take the lucerne two years and then you use the nitrogen you have into the system, so that is a carryover of nitrogen, then you got seven kilograms of nitrogen you can bring other ways. There is three ways to bring the nitrogen into the system. First, you chop the alfalfa alpha and then you spread it in the other fields. The second way is to put it in the animal's mouth, and the animals transform the alfalfa in fertilizer. They keep a little bit, but only 20% of the nitrogen for the productivity, but then you got 80% back that you can spread in other fields. And what he brought as ID, it's the third one. You put it in a methanizer and transform a methanizer not into an uh, energy producer. You, you use a methanizer to produce liquid nitrogen. So you can spread where you want nitrogen that you produce yourself with the alfalfa. And the energy is a byproduct of the methanizer. You see the way to look at things. So looking at that, I mean, you can have self-sufficient uh, farm in terms of energy and be self-sufficient in nitrogen. And a little bit of legume or seed or cover crop bring extra. But if you look at it, we're close to 200 kilogram nitrogen per year per crop. And then we can go to perennial crop. That's something we are looking at. And uh, so by the time you harvest, uh, I mean, the cover crop is already growing. It is quite a big deal in southern France where it's dry, where it is complicated to uh, drill a cover crop in the summer. But uh, it's not because it is a legume that you got to uh, lift up the lever on nitrogen because uh, the legume can be really good killers. And one, one side is where the clover was killed in December, that's where the wheat is green, and the other side, the clover was killed in the end of uh, February, early March, is where the wheat is struggling. So uh, don't give too much and to legume. Then we can think relay, relay. So that means that we got one crop harvest and the other one is already growing. There is plenty of good ideas like that. Uh, a few years ago, we started to grow oilseed rape. Uh, we planted very early, I mean, end of June, early July, covered with buckwheat. And then we harvested the buckwheat in the autumn and we kept the oilseed rape growing. So that was a way to double crop and to start a very cheap 
uh, uh, oilseed rape. Um, got some colleague in uh, North America, Jason Mork. Uh, that's the way he grow cover crop on soya bean. Okay, and the way he killed cover crop on his soya bean is with a combine harvester. And so he organized the, the trucks and organized the combine harvester. And then if you come in the middle of August, you don't know that he did harvest wheat in his uh, soya bean fields. And we are trying to start that in France is uh, between conventional summer crop or relay really cropping and uh, or double, double cropping. Uh, maybe we have to rethink it, not the way the North American are doing it, doing it. This, I took this picture in Switzerland in September, 20th of September last year. It's carrots. It's really cropping carrots in the field of wheat in Switzerland. Really cropping carrots, you know. Well, uh, they are not 100% straight, but it's carrot all right, you know. <laughs> well, well, really cropping carrots. Okay, that's not bad. And... Well, the think outside the box, you know, the, the guy in uh, and uh, going for organic uh, no-till system and with different uh, uh, areas in uh, Western France is that is direct drilling wheat in an organic field. And if you manage the rotation properly, uh, you're not going um, direct all the time, but we can do a lot of good things like that. It's another year, direct drilling, uh, that is oats in the next field. <sighs> Thinking outside the box, crazy boys. And that's Tim Boring, uh, still in the United States. When you see he's planting beans in, in relay cover crop, and yet there is a field corn on each side. And why is this guy doing that? It's to have a small light in his corn. And how to have a small light in the corn? It's to have lines of corn, not flat field of corn. And this field, is producing as much as a flat field of corn. And on top of that, he has the wheat and the soya bean. So you got to organize the combine to be able to harvest in that. Well, uh, if you start explaining that to your neighbors around Christmas, they think you probably had too much beer or gin, you know, but uh, he's doing it. And then it's with the animals. And 2001 on the farm, we let the sheep in sorghum that was three meter high. Imagine animals grazing a three meter high. It's not very high sheep, you know. And my, my, my herders are the big problems is how you build fence in such amount of biomass. So after two grazing in September, we are that back to the soil. So we were able to plant uh, chuchica in that field on that big s uh, amount of carbon. And uh, that's a chuchica afterwards with a lot of carbon back to the soil and critical back in spring. So it went well all right. And uh, so grazing animals uh, have a big part to do in uh, this new world. And uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, they are a part because they're releasing carbon, they're increasing the fertility flux into the system because they're releasing carbon. Oh, and, and we can talk about that and then, if you open, you're going to be ready for new market, new niche. The world is changing. I mean, we, we, there is a lot of new things to produce. Ten years ago, I was in Northern America, North Dakota, and they, they had that field with uh, Colandula. I met Dutch guys, and I asked them, what are you doing here? Well, we are contracting with guys in Northern Dakota to buy Susi, I mean, Colandula seed. Why? Because we can make green painting, not green green, but uh, with no uh, uh, mineral oil in it, you know, it, uh, that to sell uh, with, uh, say, <coughs> as European farmers, we could produce that. Yeah, but it's always complicated in Europe. I mean, we come in the United States and we contract with them, it's easy. I mean, it's small niche market, we went away. And I like this one. The if you Google a little bit, look at Ford, a body ham car, that was issued in 1941, that was supposed to run of methanol, and the body was made of hemp and a kind of uh, plastic made of soya bean. And, well, some people have thought already about that. Uh, limitation in the head, 
That's North America. They call this weed pinnacrest. Well, now they're taking oil out of it in order to make cardboard that you can put the French fry. I'm sorry, you call that chips here. It's French fries over there. And, <laughs> and in France, we think they come from Belgium. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but don't worry, when I'm here, I ask fish and chips. Uh, I don't <laughs> I'm not asking for fish and French fry. Okay. And but uh, they, they put that oil uh, to, 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 to s make the cardboard a bit stiffer. And uh, they got a new market. Believe, do you think tomorrow someone find a market for black grass or ray grass? <laughs> I'm waiting for that, you know. You know, you never know. But that's, uh, well, someone wants ray grass fiber, ray grass seed, black grass seed. Uh, we have plenty. And uh, perennial, we don't have to plant it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we, we get to here, perennial wheat. I mean, 20 years ago, when I first saw the first field in America, I laughed. I said, perennial wheat, <laughs> nothing. But then, you know, I'm not laughing no more. I mean, <laughs> well, direct drilling, you're right. You plant once and you harvest uh, three, four times. Well, uh, and well, the yield is low, but it's niche. But today, uh, the Japanese issue a perennial rye with high productive perennial rye. None of those things are, are coming. You know, we are in a fast changing world. We also work on potatoes. So we do the ridge in the fall, put the cover crop, and plant into a cover crop. Okay, this is to do chips, not French fry, okay? <laughs> and, and well, we change the world also in orchard. Uh, it's quite s simple. Also change in viticulture as well. Yeah, I mean, the way the vineyards were looking in France, they it was quite poor in diversity. Now they, they changed a little bit. We will talk about that uh, an hour uh, from now in another tent. And uh, we got good experience in England about that now. Uh, we also changed the world in lavender production. I got even a, a guy in south east of France. He harvests Durham barley on lavender crop. He's done some double cropping. <laughs> Amazing. And I also have a chance to, to work in, in the Andes, and uh, that's even what we are doing in bananas now. I say, well, we managed to do that in o OSR. What are we doing that in, in the banana field? It do works. <laughs> so basically, I'm getting to the end. We have to increase the photosynthesis whatsoever because we have to produce food and fiber. Um, take and sing, we need seed. One of the big input into the system will be seeds. Uh, second thing, we got to grow local forage. Uh, fourth thing, to supply energy to the soil life. Okay, I mean, we're not using energy with a tractor, but the earthworm are emitting CO2 and probably a bit of methane. I'm sure people will find sooner or later that, s I mean, a soil that is very much alive is emitting a lot of glass, uh, gr glass out gas. Okay, but it's because it's just alive. Huh? and feed the surrounding ecosystem, uh, produce renewable energy that is storable, supply organic compound, <coughs> and uh, supply the green chemistry industry. And so when you look at it, I mean, there is a great future for agriculture. I mean, uh, and uh, I'm glad I'm here, and, and I'm glad you're here, and uh, even if we're struggling sometime, and if you look at that, we will sequester carbon 100%. But that will be the good su consequences of agri agriculture. That is not an aim to sequester carbon. All right? So, and if you are the positive attitude, I'm going to finish with a kind of psychology kind of things. Well, you open. And when something positive comes, an opportunity comes, you will grab it. And, and the most input we will put is ecology. Not ecology as a religion, but ecology as a science. And we will still use a little bit of machinery, a little bit of diesel, a little bit of agrochemicals, a little bit of fertilizer now and then. Because we, you need that to gear the system. And we're, but we could use a, a lot less and still be very, very productive. Thank you very much. And we open to some questions now.
Thank you for a very nice presentation, Frederick. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more about this trade-off between relay or double cropping compared to cover cropping for the fertility part of it or the perennial living mulches? Because if you try to go for the double crop, you won't be able to go for the cover crop part of it. See what I mean? Yeah, so y you're talking about the nitrogen flux between yeah the, the nitrogen flux and all this trade-off. Okay, um, thanks, Frederick, for for this uh, tricky question. Um, by the time you're increasing the productivity of an area, okay, uh, I will take first of all the relay cropping guy that is producing uh, 21 tons, 21 tons of uh, corn and uh, and wheat. Um, well and barley. Uh, if you look first at the barley, uh, 9.7 tons. You probably need uh, 180 kilo of nitrogen that will be exported with a seed. Okay, I'm talking exportation with a seed, and uh, and with mice, uh, usually it's 12 kilograms per ton of grain you are exporting. So it will be another 130 kilogram of nitrogen that will be exported with a seed. I'm not talking about the needs for the crop, but in one year in that field, you will export, I mean, 180 and 130, you close to 300 kilograms, 300, between 300 and 350, more or less. You will export that from your field, even if you leave the straw and the stalk. There is no dream in that, which means that you will revolve in the old system if you want to grow the stalk and you want to grow the straw you will need 500 kilograms of nitrogen so that's why I start by saying you need a soil that is in very good shape you know have uh, you know a formula one soil if your soil is very uh, you know uh, smooth and not going well you can't do that you, you and that means that you need this flux of fertility and so if you're not bringing that much nitrogen well this means that you are taking it from your soil that you're decreasing your your future profitability or productivity as well so there is no dream that's why we will need a lot of legume to secure in a system the amount of nitrogen and we will have to be able to carry nitrogen from one place to the other because um, if we just like the soil supplying nitrogen, and you look at, at it here, or like, like in France, I'm sure in Denmark, the same thing. If you look organic wheat, I mean, we're really down in the yield. Because you can't get the nitrogen being carried over the winter, and this, the mineralization starts a long time after the needs of the crop. So if you don't can't carry nitrogen into the system, it's why the methanization uh, or the, the manure with a kind of slurry to bring nitrogen where you need it and, and ready to go nitrogen is, is essential to keep a higher yield and a higher productivity in that system. Did I answer your question? But thanks for, because this is, is, is you need high fertility to go in that direction. We have the question here. Hello. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about flea beetle control in oilseed rape. So I gather you're not using any pesticides at all when you buy crop it with the beans. Or do you graze the oilseed rape over the winter and then s sow the beans in the spring? And when you do that, first of all, are you looking at a massive yield reduction because of the flea beetle populations in the countryside? Or can you get the benefit straight away? I'm not sure I understood your question properly. Uh, you're talking about the beans and the oilseed rape? You're talking the beans and the oilseed rape? Yes. And yeah. the, the, the beetles on the system as well? Uh, this is just new. Or oh, it's just new. Uh, we are, for the last two years, uh, the Terra Innovia in France, which is the old setium taking care of the legume and the oilseed rape um, uh, development, uh, 
they looked at what we were doing on different farms where we were grazing and they noticed that uh, there was some kind of reduction of the flea beetles by the time you were grazing. Well, it seems logical, you reduce the number of leaves, okay? Uh, but frankly, talking, uh, it is very tricky to uh, graze properly because you got to have an early seeding to seed early so they have a good development of the oilseed rape and a good development of the companion crop and and to leave the sheep uh, really just what you need you know and uh, the place the sheep tend to lay down you may get a hole in the field so i don't want to sell dreams okay but uh, we we saw some kind interesting reduction and so they probably we 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 think in uh, some animals when you connect with the animals uh, growing area uh, it could be an air, uh, a way to get uh, um, uh, and a summer forage uh, easy um, and good forage and also a way to increase the number of uh, oyster rape field in those areas where they are not um, with a very easy management because uh, a several farmer is keen to get with a sprayer and manage and watch the flea beetle but uh, a sheep farmer uh, well he, he like his sheep and uh, he's not s s you know checking his his oilseed rape but oilseed rape could have fantastic results in, in animals area because there is a lot of fertility and a lot of fertility in the fall in the autumn and it is one of the plants to trying to insert more into uh, the areas where there is uh, a lot of animals so it probably a, a way to push it forward did I answer your question but it's not miracle yet okay the last one Well, uh, your question is, I got an apple orchard, what should I do? Uh, well, I first invite you to go to the next meeting we will have on uh, viticulture and uh, regenerative viticulture, and you will have s uh, some information about that. Uh, but quickly talking, um, uh, when you look at the farming system, whatsoever farming system you, you, you meet, uh, you have to try to understand where is the difficult point of that system where, where what is pulling you down and when you are in viticulture when you have an orchard you have to understand that you're doing monoculture at the same place for a long time viticulture in france is even worse you know we've been doing that for <coughs> five six hundred years at the same place okay so well, you have the disease, you have the bugs, they are just waiting, you know, you, 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 you cultivate your problem over generation and generation. And so we, we, you have to compensate that, bring diversity into your, the, the thing, and, and the cover crop bring more biomass, because usually you don't feed the soil at the uh, right level, and you, you bring a lot bigger diversity and by bringing also the soil life back, you will digest the residue, the leaves and everything faster that will, that will reduce the inoculant of your future problem. Okay, that's mainly the three big strategy. Uh, but then, uh, that's the principle, but then you have to get into it, and, uh, but it's, it's quite, I wouldn't say harder, uh, because when w we plant wheat, corn, or oyster rape, it is, it's not a perennial plant, and when you plant it in cover crop, it's not like a tree. A tree is there, or a bush is there. Well, uh, you it, I, I look at it more easy. Then, one more thing you got easier to introduce is animals. And uh, grazing animals, or poultry, because they can manage insects, they can manage a lot of bugs. Uh, especially rats you can have in uh, rodent in, in in trees well, well they when they see the chicken arriving in 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 the orchard you know the the rodent uh, don't like the chicken or the chicken like too much the rodent so. all right
a little last, last one, yeah. I just wondered what your thoughts on carbon trading and the idea of selling your carbon for offsetting. How do I do that? Uh, what do you think about the idea? Uh, <laughs> it is a fantastic idea. Uh, but uh, I will extend my answer. Uh, I've been waiting for this moment. Well, th there is a song like that. Huh? Been waiting for this moment all my life. Huh? <laughs> 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 uh, well, I'm not going to sing. I'm not good, good at that. <laughs> Someone play the battery? <laughs> the, the drum? Okay. Now I've been waiting for this uh, 30 years. 30 years, you know, because we were sure, I mean, I mean, by people pushing carbon, I mean, we, we grow photosynthesis, we organic matter is linked to carbon, you know. It took 30 years to get to this point. So the day I was able to have a check from that, you know, you've been working 30 years. So I say, even in French, we say, yes. <laughs> no, we don't say we, oui. we say yes in French. <laughs> so I say, yes, I was, I was very happy. Um, it is interesting on many things, because it is a recognition what about what you can do, you know, about the best for the planet. Some people say, okay, you're offsetting some other people that do pollution. Okay, but someone has to do it, you know? And, uh, and then it is pushing for better farm practices. It is a kind of subsidy for better farm practices. And, and also, and it's probably for me, a recognition what farming can do. And I like the figures I showed you. I make a lot of, a lot of many times people take the calculator and figure out how much carbon they got in their fields and transfer that or transform that in kilometers of emission of your car. And it's always surprising because you always get to 100,000 kilometers. It's amazing. And then those figures can be connecting to what no conventional public knows because everyone almost know how much cost airplane you know you can google and they even when you buy a ticket they tell you how much carbon and you can offset your carbon i say no i offset already my carbon you know do you want some carbon from my farm to offset the <laughs> other guys in the plane with me you know i can offset almost a full airplane <laughs> and you imagine the guys getting in the airplane and you are with your beret <laughs> and they put a check in your beret each one <laughs> thanks thanks no, it's, it's fantastic, and it's it's a good communication tool as well to to show uh, you know that agriculture has a real power, a real power. It's not talking, it's not commercial, it's not made up. You know, as a real power in terms of climate. And I didn't have time to explain how cow works because many people tell you that cows are very bad for the planet, but when you put them into the system, they are fantastic. And okay, they emit carbon, they emit a bit of methane, but it's the carbon and methane that the soil will not emit. <coughs> and, and, and if you produce more biomass, I'm going back, well, the soil will emit more carbon. So uh, at one stage, you know, some people would get crazy about that, but these are very good things because it's logical, we can measure, and if really putting farming, uh, showing that farming can do a lot of things. Thanks for your question. All right. So anyway, hope uh, I give you some good information and I see you. I, s I see you later uh, at the dairy tent for the viticulture, if you like to. And tomorrow I will be talking carbon and nitrogen at the blue tent at the entrance. <laughs>